as we sing that song do we yo let's lift our voices Dios está llamando a la guerra Dios está impulsando hacia afuera acudiremos al llamado del Señor tomaremos las armas Dios está llamando Dios está llamando a la guerra Dios está impulsando hacia afuera Acudiremos Acudiremos al llamado del Señor Tomaremos las armas que nos preparó Tú y yo Tú y yo Somos su pueblo Let's praise the Lord together, church. We're going to lift our voices. We're going to continue on singing as we sing that song, Glorious Day. And I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry? And who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tears. Let's sing that verse again. I was buried. And I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that away? It was 
Jesus, if there is freedom in this place tonight, let's continue on as we set an atmosphere of worship here, as we open our hearts and lift our voices onto the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. again alone in my sorrow
Yes, we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, we're free. the Lord this evening church man what a wonderful presence of God in this Sunday night amen two great songs I love that song which you know jumping out of the grave and the idea that we're free you know he who the sun sets free is free indeed the reason why we can sing like we can sing and worship because we are redeemed of what God has done and what Jesus did on that cross if you're here you're looking for something you're looking for answers I'm telling you you came to the right place God's gonna help you amen we want to lift up these certain prayer requests we want to keep praying amen we want to pray for uh, Angela Adami for good results and also pray for Bernie Ivana for going to surgery. He needs a miracle of God. God's hand be upon that. I want to keep those in prayer. I want to pray for Mr. Trejo. I talked to him this morning. He's going to be having a procedure coming up. I want to pray that God's hand would be upon that. We also want to keep living, our sister Linda Yoder. God's hand to be upon her. Uh, Liz Garcia and all those that are sick in body. Monarikas, keep praying for them, believing God. We also know there's some people that are sick. We just want to pray that God's hand to be upon them. Don't forget the conference that's coming up. We're going to pray for God's hand to be upon that. All that are traveling back for missionaries we want God's hand to be upon them. And as we pray and we lay hold of God, we need God in the service. Amen. As we do this, my brother Tony Cervantes is going to lead us to the throne of grace. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your mercy. All that you're going to do, Lord God, we pray that you... Lord, we give you praise, Father, tonight. God, we pray for the grace of God, Lord, the mercies of God, Lord, to be up over this congregation, God. We pray, Father, that you would meet with us tonight, God, that you would speak words in due season, God. Break chains tonight, God, of bondage, God. I pray, God, save souls tonight, God. I pray, minister at these altars, Lord, powerfully, Father. Let there be miracles, God, supernatural wonders that will take place, God, even tonight, God. God, I pray that you would touch those that are sick in their body, lifted up high before the throne of grace, God. I pray that you would meet, God, every single need, Lord, in this place, God. Uh, God, I pray, Father, for the grace of God, Lord, to be over this service, God. Uh, your presence, Lord, in this place, God. I pray, touch the nations, God, and our churches, God, that faithfully, God, minister in the mission field, God. I pray, Father, for your, your help tonight, God. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, demons will have to fail. When we stand in the name of Jesus, tell me who can stand before us. When we stand in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. Thank you, Song Service. Welcome to the Door Christian Fellowship, where God is changing lives. We do have some announcements for this week to let you know what's going on. We do have prayer as early as 5.30 in the morning from 5.30 to 8, Monday to Friday. If you come, you can come to prayer here in our back area. And we do have Overcomer's Prayer on Saturday, which is at 9 a.m. That is our other building. We'll be having it there, and that starts at 9 a.m. Encourage you to be a part of all that God is doing. This service, uh, this week, we do have our midweek service, which is on Wednesday. That's at 7.30. We have an hour of prayer before that. I encourage you to be a part of that if you can't come uh, throughout. The, uh, if you can't come on a weekend, we always encourage you to come to make out our midweek service. And again, it's always a good time. Uh, the other things we do have going on is that uh, this coming uh, Sunday, we do have our Sunday school out of 
Battle Ready, which starts at 9.45. Encourage you to be a part of that. It's on spiritual warfare. Had a tremendous insight this morning. Really good Sunday school this morning. Great testimonies. It was a great time. Encourage you to be a part of all that God is doing. Uh, and then also at 11 o'clock, we do have our 11 o'clock service. We do have children's church and nurseries, Sunday school classes for the kids. Please let us, if you need any information on that, you can let us know. We can give you direction for that. Any of the ushers can give you that. And then on Sunday night, every Sunday night, we do have services at 7. 7 p.m. and an hour of prayer before that. Uh, big announcements we do have for this week is Friday. We are going to be uh, doing the memorial of our sister Bridget. Uh, they have it back here and I encourage you to be a part of that. It should be a wonderful time. It has, it's, a, it's Yes, it's a time of mourning, but it's also a time of celebration that our sister made it. She made it through the finish line. She ran the race and ran it well. And amen, we can come together. It's going to be a packed house. I already know it is. A lot of people, she had a very a big influence in this congregation as a pillar in this congregation, but around the world. So it'd be a great time to encourage you. If you've never been to a, a, a Christian that has been faithful in a church for a long period of time, you come, you can see what God is doing. Amen. Such a blessing to be a part of that. So don't forget that this Friday. The other announcements we do have is that we're going to be having uh, an outreach tomorrow. And this will be at the main campus uh, of UTSA, and it's at 7.30 uh, off of uh, Sombrilla. And if you want to be a part of that, please get with Rito Rodella, and he'll give you directions in that. That's, this, that's tomorrow. We're also going to have another outreach tomorrow, Monday, at Walgreens off of Marbach of Military if you, at 7 p.m. Get with uh, Joey Martinez, and we have one more outreach coming up, and that's going to be tonight right after service. Uh, the normal Marbach and Haral get with Tony Cervantes right after service. Amen. I think that's pretty much all the announcements we do have in saying that. Let's take up an offering as ushers come. <laughs> Richard Viela told me a, a, a funny story after prayer on Saturday. We were talking. He told me the story about his mother was a tear, uh, caretaker for a family that was a, a construction company here in San Antonio. And what they would do every year, they would go, go on vacation. They would take Richard's mother, the caretaker, with them on their private jet, and they would go there to the Bellagio there in Vegas. And her job was to take care of Mama and, and the parents there. And she said the, he said that his mother told her is that the, the mother of this construction company, every time they would get her to go gamble, they'd give her a stack of $100 bills, and they would put it in her hand. She'd get the money. And then the next day she go, they give her another stack of $100 bills so that she could go spend and do whatever she wants there at the Bellagio. But what was funny is the mother said that she never gambled. Every time she got the money, she just put it right in her pocket and says, okay, ask a little bit more. I, I don't know what happened. I guess it's gone. Give a little bit more. So Richard was trying to tell me, should she invest it into the Bellagio? I said, well, I don't know about all that, bro. We're Christians. We don't gamble. But I thought about it. I thought it was rather funny that she kept that money. There's two parts I can go with this. I can go with the fact that, you know, Christians don't gamble. But the truth is, I thought about that. We don't gamble, right? I mean, right? <laughs> hey, Pastor, if I win that lotto, man, I'm going to give towards that. Praise God. Amen. And just believe God sacrifies that lottery ticket. But the truth is, is that we don't gamble because it's throwing money away. We have no idea. It's it's not what God intended. He never intended us to give money this way. But I, I thought about this because I want to read a scripture out of Proverbs 19:17. It says this: He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and she will pay back what he has given. No, I, I said that to say this. When we give to God, it is not a gamble ever. See, gamble is you're giving money not knowing maybe, you know, maybe we'll get it, maybe we won't. But when you give to God, it is never a gamble. I know we're going to be having conference soon, and they'll say it's like gambling. I don't, listen, I don't believe that. I believe when we give to God and we lend to the Lord, not like he leads your money, but when we lend to the Lord, he always pays you back. It's, it's a, listen, it's a sure deal. It's a sure investment. If you want an investment that's sure, that's going to go into eternity, give to God. And he always pays back, not just a little bit, more. And that's the way God's nature is. He says, look, he says, if you trust me with your money, I'll give you more. That's just the way God is. I believe in prosperity. I believe that God wants to bless his people. I do not believe that God wants you to be in poverty. 
I believe he wants you to be blessed. I believe this church, he wants you to be blessed. That is the gospel that God wants to make your life better. Yes, in heaven, but also here on earth. Amen. So as we do this, my brother Bill Lucas, if you could pray for the offering. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Come on, everybody. Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Come on, everybody. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the so much love. There's so much love in the kingdom. There's so much love in the kingdom. There's so much love in the kingdom. Come on, everybody. There's so much love in the kingdom. There's so much love in the kingdom. There's so much love in the kingdom. Come on, everybody. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Righteousness and peace. And joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the righteousness and peace. Righteousness and peace. And joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Amen. Thank you, musicians. Feels good to be in the house of God tonight. Um, what a blessing it is to be in God. I really do enjoy Sunday night services. Since I got saved, I know Sunday night service, I, I've, I've just always felt they have a grace on them, and I'm uh, so glad to be in the house of God this evening. Glad you're with us. Open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Pastor Martino is saying, we don't gamble, and it got a little quiet. <laughs> we don't claim our losing when we gamble, but... Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, I um, want to look at this evening uh, something that uh, uh, in my heart I've been praying about this. And I, I'm looking at the pulpit right now too. I leave for a week, come back and the pulpit's different. <laughs> Looks nice. We were down in Harlingen this last week and um, there with Pastor Rito and Dora doing a revival. Church is doing really good. They're doing a great job down there. It was packed Wednesday night. Uh, had visitors come in. There's a school across the street. The principal from the school came into the building, came into the service. And uh, the reason they came was because they said, we see people here in the morning. And then we see them every night, every day of the week. And I'm trying to figure out what's going on in this place. And uh, she came in and it was really a great time being down there. Really appreciated it. Um, and then we got in the sun a little too long. And yeah, it's not the lighting. I did get a little darker while I was down there. Ephesians chapter 4. You know, there's something about the power of words. Words have this ability. The Bible actually says life and death is in the power of the tongue. For a person who's not un who doesn't understand this, that sounds a bit overrated or even melodramatic. But the truth is, and part of what I want to look at tonight is words are very powerful. They have the ability to really move people, help people. They also have the ability to hurt people very badly. 
They can be misunderstood in a lot of ways. And the truth is, when there is big misunderstandings, things can go bad really uh, quickly. And I, I enjoy these statements I'm going to read to you, mainly because they're big misunderstandings that don't do a lot of harm. But I always find them enjoyable to read. This is mistranslations that you find around the world of ideas or concepts from English into another language. In a, De in a Denmark airline office, this is from De uh, Danish to English, it says, we take your bags and send them in all directions. On the door of a Moscow hotel room, if this is your first visit to Russia, you're welcome to it. On a Bucharest hotel elevator, the lift is being fixed for the next day. During that time, we regret that you will be unbearable. People are unbearable when they have to take the stairs. This is true, though. On a restaurant menu in Poland, salad is a firm's own make Limpid red bead soup with cheesy dumplings in the form of a finger. Roasted duck let loose. Beef rashers beaten up with the country people's fashion. Kathleen experienced this kind of situation while we were living overseas. She had to go into surgery. While she's going into surgery, one of the doctors is standing next to her, walking with her as she's laid out on the gurney, getting ready to go into the room. And as he's walking with her, he looks down and he says, Dendrous. She looks up and she's thinking in her mind, why is he telling me this is dangerous right now? And he looks at her and as they continue walking, he says it again, dangerous. And she, the only thing she can think, she goes, yeah. So she tells him, yes, this is dangerous. And he looks confused. And he's walking with her. He's, you can tell he's thinking and he looks at her again and he says, dangerous. Dentures? Not dangerous. He's asking if she has dentures. And then she got offended because she's like, are you kidding me? Dentures? How do I look? <laughs> the truth about words is when they're misunderstood or when they're used wrongly, they have a powerful effect. The verse we're going to read is actually out of the book of Ephesians. I, I got inspired as uh, Pastor Martinez is doing this Sunday School out of Ephesians, there, in chapter 4, there's a section that really should be called church conduct. Because that's really what it's about. If you've ever wondered, what does the Bible say about living with other people in church? It's in Ephesians 4. And we're going to take one scripture out of the, the several that are there. And a lot of times we use these scriptures by themselves and apply them by themselves. But when you read the context... It's about living with other people in church. You know that, that uh, verse that says, be angry and sin not. That's in that whole little context. Because the Bible knows, God knows, that when we're in church, people can make us angry. <laughs> you don't have to agree with me, but you know it's true. People will make us angry. And so it's in there. It says, be angry and sin not. Don't let your anger take you out of church. That's in essence <laughs> what it's saying. Well, the verse we're going to read is in verse 29 of Ephesians 4. One single verse I want to look at, and we're going to kind of dig into the concepts or the principles that are laid out in this one single verse and try to apply them to our own personal lives here. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, I want to preach on building up. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. That word edification should be translated or could be translated as building up. That it may impart grace to the hearers. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would anoint your word tonight. I ask that there would be a depositing of revelation that grace is available for every Christian to be released and imparted from their own lives. Help us to see our words as vehicles of either corruption or of grace. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen. Let's talk first about words hurt. The truth about relationships and conflicts is it's constantly revolving around words. If someone says the wrong thing, you quickly run into a serious problem. People can say something not even meaning to try to hurt or trying to instigate anything. Just the fact 
of them saying it because of the person's situation, the other person's background, what's gone on that day. I don't know about you, but I know sometimes coming into church, there's a whole lot that's going on outside these four walls in my life. When I come in, people can say something not even knowing what's happening. And it will, as the modern term is, trigger something. People start getting frustrated and angry. But then there is a whole other side to this where words are used on purpose to destroy. In our verse, this is an incredibly insightful idea that the Bible lays out to us in verse 20. Let no corrupt word. Now, the idea here of corruption is one of decay. This isn't, some translations will use the word vulgar. That doesn't give it justice. It says something like coarse speak bad talking this isn't cuss words it's talking about this is actually the idea of rotting or uh, dying something that is rotten dying or if you could imagine something like rotted meat rotten fish that's the idea that there are words that have the ability that when they touch you they start to decay you as well i don't know about you but if you've ever had garbage in the house for too long you can smell when it's there. That's the idea of this word. It's not just a bad word. It's a corrupting word. It's a word that begins to affect people in such a way that it starts to destroy or decay in their spirit. It creates, if you can imagine, a spiritual infection. That there are words that can infect people. There are words that carry with them this viral ability to continue to propagate itself to hurt that person. Why would people say that stuff? Well, you don't have to live too long to realize that people just like to hurt other people sometimes. That when you get into group settings, church is not just the exception. At your job, at your school, in your family, You know the people I feel bad for? I feel bad for the people who have no filter. You ever met those people? I just like to say it how it is. Whatever comes to my mind, I say it. I feel bad for those people. Because no one likes them. No one wants to talk to them. Everybody knows it's almost like waiting for somebody to shoot a gun. Everybody's kind of waiting for when they're going to finally say it. Sometimes it's humorous. Because there are some people we do want to let loose on. We'd love to turn those people like cannonballs to certain others. Here, go talk to that person right now. <laughs> and the truth is, this idea of corrupt words is that this person will speak something. And it begins to get lodged in that person's spirit. It begins to frustrate them. It doesn't have to be mean-spirited either. Sometimes this is how the real power of gossip works. You ever remember that story? David's coming back and he meets Ziba. This is the guy, the servant of Mephibosheth. And he tells David that Mephibosheth was rebelling against him. And that he was trying to rally people and take what David had. David goes to Mephibosheth and Mephibosheth tells him, no, this is the guy that David helped into his home. This is the guy that David blessed. And because of Ziba, the Bible says that David after that day split what Mephibosheth had. Why is that story important? Well, in the Jewish tradition, that story they would use to show the real power of when you're speaking about someone else and you really have no idea what you're saying. That there is an effect that is created. It's gossip is, it, the truth is, people like to call any kind of information gossip if they don't like it. I don't like to talk to them because they always like to gossip. They're always gossiping. They're, these people always gossip. You ever met those people that they get frustrated about everybody else in church? They're always gossiping about somebody else. Talking in general, I mean, like, let's say we talk about the economy. We're gossiping about the economy? No. The real effect of gossip is when you have no clue what it is. You're jumping to conclusions. And you're doing it on purpose. And the reason you're trying to do it is to destroy, undermine, 
or create in that person you're speaking to an idea that would hurt this person. That is the real power that the, the Bible talks about gossip. And the real issue here in our verse is the issue of corruption. One of the things that, that happens in this context of verses is it talks about anger. It talks about lying. It talks about stealing. The verses before and after this deal with how should you deal with people around you. One, you shouldn't steal from them. Not only should you not steal from them, you should have a heart to give to them. You shouldn't be angry so that it causes you to sin. You shouldn't lie. You should tell people the truth. Not your truth, right? Not what you think about everything. Your single opinion. It's the truth. The principles that are eternal. That's like the idea. And so you have this, this moment here in the middle of all these big concepts, all these big ideas from this text, and it deals with the issue of how we speak to one another. You know why? Because of Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit, broad of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. You want to know why the Bible speaks about words in a Christian's life? Because they're directly connected to your heart. And when you have things that are going on in your heart, like bitterness, guess what? You like to bitterly talk about people. When you have an issue in your heart like jealousy, when you have an issue in your heart like envy, oh yeah, that brother, they gave him that position. You know why? Because they like him. They don't like me. And, and really, when you start digging into how these people start to think, you realize it's not like they have this great insight. There's something that is corrupting their heart, and now they're handing off that corruption. A corrupt word comes from a corrupt heart. It says, do not let any corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. That means you would have to start watching your heart. You would have to start looking at what's happening on the inside. Because the Bible tells us words have power and they're connected to your heart, there has to be a place where you stop and say, okay, why do I keep talking about these people? Why, why do I... Okay, look, just act like I'm talking to about someone else, not you tonight, okay? Everybody starts getting real quiet. Why is it that I'm having this problem with being able to control what I say? Let's get back to the people who have no filter. You know the people I feel more bad for than I did, if that's correct, English grammatically? I feel more bad for the people who are married to people who have no filter. Those are the ones I really feel bad for because they have to live with someone who has no ability to contain what they're saying and they're constantly shooting out bullets they can't take back. And then they wonder why everybody's angry. Why, I don't know why my spouse is so angry. I don't know why they're just so frustrated. Maybe, maybe because you keep shooting them every morning. It gets awkward when you're around people, couples. And the one has just been subjugated by the other because of their words. And they think it's so normal for them to speak to each other or for that person to speak in that weird way. Well, they just like to say what comes to mind. They won't ever hold back. Well, what I noticed is that those people can't take it when you do the same thing to them. That's just what I noticed from the few people that I've met. It's not been a lot in the world, just a few. That when you try to say something back, all of a sudden, it frustrates them. Now, bear with me here because this is really not what I'm preaching about. This is just something I'm focusing on because of the initial part of our text that deals with the corruption of speech and the power for it to decay someone else's life. And if you simply have the attitude, well, my words don't mean much. I can say what I want. Think twice, because I really believe this is what Jesus is talking about when people get judged for what they say. It's not just kind of this joke that you make or this, I, 
there is something that's in your heart that you constantly have to say something. And in that saying, there is always a response back, or I should say there is always this release of this corruption. What I want to talk to you is the second part. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good uh, for necessary edification or building up. And I want to talk to you about that secondly. There are three pictures that I want to give to you tonight of what it's like to have this kind of conversation. What it's like to be that kind of person that speaks this way. Now, the truth is, when I start talking about words and the power of words, one of the weird things that can happen is because of today's political correctness, you have this thing where you can't say a whole lot of anything. That if you do tell somebody something, it's got to always be like positively encouraging. That there's a truth to encouragement. But you know, I'm not a big fan of the people who graduate kindergarten. You know what I mean? Like it was kindergarten. If you graduated kindergarten, good for you. I'm happy for you. But the truth is, an environment where you kind of have to be overly sensitive isn't healthy either. But the Bible does clearly tell us, especially from the pictures I'm going to show you, and there's so many more, but these are New Testament images of what I believe and why the Apostle Paul, when he speaks this in Ephesians, he's not just speaking in a vacuum. He understood there are moments when you say the right thing, it'll change someone's life. And I'm not overly stating that. And I am not only talking about preaching. This is the power of this verse, which we're going to get to in a little while. People constantly think about impartation only as what we can do. Well, this verse wasn't written to pastors. This verse was written to the congregation. And in that verse, it says imparting grace. That means you can impart grace. You can impart grace. So let's look at it here, building up. <laughs> the second part. Or I should say this first picture I want to look at is out of Acts chapter 16. This is the Apostle Paul. He was put in prison. And now the prison doors are open and the keeper of the prison is awaking from sleep and seeing. This is in verse 27. And seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm. For we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. The first thing I want to look at, and what's absolutely necessary for a speech, or words that build up, is you have to give hope to people. You will sometimes come across people who are just like this man in a terrible situation. He is going to kill himself. This is not being overstated in the Bible. This is really happening because of what's taking place. If the prisoners leave, he's the one who's going to be on the hook. And him realizing this, he draws his sword, gets ready to kill himself, and Paul says, his words that he throws out there are, do yourself no harm, for we are all here don't do it. You know why? There are better days ahead. It's going to be okay. You're going to make it. You know the truth is, this is true for people who come into church. They come in all messed up. They come in with all kinds of problems. So many problems, you get encouraged by talking to them because you thought you had problems. But what can take place is you start hearing some of the complicated situations and in your mind, you're trying to figure out the solution. You know what? The solution, it's simple. Don't give up. Keep moving because there is hope. <laughs> well, how is this all going to work out? I don't know how it's all going to work out, to be honest with you. But don't stop because there is hope. The truth is, he realized as he's looking at this man, the only hope this man has is if I say something right now. Beloved, listen to me. People will come in and your words mean so much more than you think. So much more. When people come in and they start, and they, you tell them, we're glad to see you, we're glad you're here. If they come and ask you about certain things that have gone on in their life, or ask your opinion, or ask for advice, the goal is not to set them straight, not when they first come in. The goal is to give them hope. 
we'll get to setting straight in a little while. Because there's a truth here that we do have to also embrace. Telling someone they can break the power of sin is not judging them. That's setting them free. And so we'll, we'll look at that in a little while. <laughs> but the first one here is the Philippian jailer and the apostle Paul recognized if I'm going to help this guy out, he has to know there is hope. Also, the second thing I want to look at here very quickly he says, sir, what must I do to be saved? That's the actual New Testament term for salvation. And the reason why that's important is it gives us a picture of what people thought in the New Testament salvation was. Salvation is being rescued from where you are, not just your heart, but where you're at as well. That means from the friends and the prisons that you're in, you're rescued out of that when you get saved. This isn't just a church thing, that salvation is what you do when you come to church. Salvation is what happens here, and it should affect everything out there as well. Sir, what must I do to be saved? He's not just saying from right now, how can I pray? He's not saying, what should I do about the inside of my heart? He's literally going to kill himself. He's looking at a situation. They could judge him because of what's happened here in this prison. And he's asking them the question, how can God help me out of this? That is true salvation. How can God help me out of this? Bad relationship, drug addiction, alcoholism, workaholism. How can God help me out of this? That's the idea of salvation in the Bible. Let's look at the second one. This is Jesus. He's walking with Jairus, going to heal his daughter. Jairus' servants come and they tell him, stop Leave Jesus alone, your daughter is dead. And this is what Jesus says. While he was still speaking, this is out of Luke chapter 8 verse 49, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, your daughter is dead, do not trouble the teacher. This is, they're talking about Jesus. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, do not be afraid, only believe and she will be made well. You know what people need to hear? You know what kind of words help people at those moments where everything tells them to give up? Don't stop now. Whatever you do, take the next step. People need to hear living by faith is not something that you think about. Living by faith is not stopping. Keep moving. I lost my job. Find another one. They repoed my car. Get a bus pass. Do something. There has to be this moment where it's not, oh, pobrecito. Man, it's so hard. It's so bad. When, you know, when they're inviting you to their pity party, you have to help them understand. You can keep moving. Don't stop and start looking around at everyone and looking around at what's happening, looking around at the job, looking at all the reasons why you should stop. Don't. Because things can change in a way you can't even imagine right now. And you know, the wonderful thing about our congregation, and for the most part, as I'm preaching this, I know there's a lot of us here. Your testimonies, your background is this. Your, your ability, uh, what you've gone through is what people need to hear. It's wonderful to find a group of people that have fought for something. Because we can tell others it's worth fighting for. Don't give up. Jairus stops. And Jesus says, don't be afraid, only believe. Those are five words, but they're powerful. Don't let fear paralyze you. Keep believing. I, you know, maybe you're here tonight and you're thinking to yourself, I don't know how things can change. I don't know how this can work out. I have no idea. Don't be afraid. Only believe. I promise you, I pro you won't regret it later. You will regret stopping. The third picture. John chapter 8. This one's one of my favorites. It's my favorites not because of what most people focus on in this verse. This is a very prominent and a very, uh, it's a verse, a lot of people, very popular verse. Verse 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 7 says, So when they continued asking him, this is they're asking Jesus, he raised himself up and said to them, This is the adulterous woman that was caught in adultery. 
at that moment. Such a complicated story when you think about that whole situation. They believe the reason why they caught her was a setup. That's why they caught her. And now they bring her out to Jesus, and they want Jesus to kill her. They want him to throw stones at her. So when, he continued, uh, uh, when, so when they continued asking him to throw stones at her, he himself raised, them, uh, raised, uh, raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, said to her, Woman, where are the accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? So she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now this is why I love this story. I know I get it. And this is where people focus on Jesus not condemning her. That is powerful. But you know what's so powerful to me? This is a woman who's been committing adultery. She's not, you know, your Sunday school teacher. Well, at least not in our church. She's not a saint. This is, this is a wicked lady. And the words, I do not condemn you, that a lot of people can say that. I think even Gandhi could say that. But you know what no one else can say? Go and sin no more. You know why that's so powerful? Jesus wouldn't have said it if she couldn't do it. Jesus wouldn't have said that if he believed she couldn't stop living that way. You know what people need to hear? They need to hear they can stop. They need to hear that they can live a life free from the sin that keeps them in bondage. This is where the PC culture gets it all wrong. Just accept me as I am. Don't say anything that would offend me. I was born this way. We were born all messed up. Let's be honest. We were born all messed up. Some people were born as thieves. Some people were born as murderers. Some people were born and walk into a life of harlotry. And the Bible is covered with stories like this where they go and sin no more. That makes the difference here. It's not just saying, okay, I'm not going to condemn you. No, no, I, you know, I don't condemn. No, I don't like to judge anybody. This is not just about judgment. Listen to it's not just about judgment. This becomes such a big deal for a PC culture. You can't judge anybody, can't say anything. Well, I don't want to offend them. Truthfully, if I offend them but they get set free, then I offend them. But they got to get set free. That's the crucial part of this whole story. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. People need to hear they can be set free. Not just covered up, not just hidden, not overlooked, but they can be set free. These are three pictures for us in the New Testament that help us see when we build people up, there has to be a place where we give them hope. And to truly encourage them to live by faith, that means you just got to keep moving. Living by faith isn't this mysterious thing, it, it really is pretty simple. When everything falls apart, don't stop moving. Keep going. And helping people understand they can be free. And I want to close here with imparting grace. One of the things that you realize about this verse, and I was saying this a little bit earlier, is that as it's written to the New Testament church, it's not written solely to pastors. or It's not just written to people who are in ministry. It's written to the congregation. And the way you know that is in the beginning of chapter 4, it starts to tell them that there were gifts given to the church. Pastors, apostles, teachers, evangelists. Well, it says that because it's helping everyone understand that those are the gifts given. And as it keeps talking about this and it keeps reiterating these ideas, it starts to explain that one of the things that happens when we're talking about using the power of your words, it's not just that you can hurt people. It's not just that you can have these words with a corrupting effect, you can actually impart grace by your words. Have you ever had that experience? 
where someone talks to you and you feel like God's talking to you? And you feel like maybe you were going to stop, you were going to give up. But because of what that person said, and they don't even know it. They have no idea what's happening in your life. They don't know all the things that are going on. They have no clue. And yes, that word grace in there is the word cherish. The exact concept everybody loves to tout. But I want us to understand it says you can impart that grace. Well, how do you impart that grace? You got to give it like God does. Freely to everyone. That means there has to be a moment where the people that you consider enemies, you now consider someone you can impart grace to. There's a shift that has to happen in the heart. Where in the moment of your life, as you're here in church, you start to realize God isn't just calling you to sit in the pew and listen to sermons. He's calling you, yes, to outreach and to evangelize. But when you do that, he's calling you to impart grace to people. That means the power of your words are meant to speak into their lives. And there is a literal grace. The grace of God are a vehicle. Your words become a vehicle for that grace. Well, I thought only preachers did that. I thought only pastors could do that. This verse says all of us can do that. I would say this also, this is a good idea, and it's a good lesson, it's a good thing to try to do in your marriage. Instead of being criticizing and angry and constantly frustrated, maybe every once in a while take a step back and say, how can I impart grace right now into my marriage? Or you don't have to, it's up to you. I feel like some of you are like, nah, I don't know about that. Grace is something powerful. We all know that. Most of us have heard sermons on grace, maybe even read books about grace. Well, all that, your words have the power to impart. I know this Friday we're going to be having the celebration memorial service for our sister Bridget. I was thinking about this because one of the things that happens when you're a missionary is you come back to America on furlough every once in a while. And when you come back, you're, 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 you, you go through, it's, it's like a quick transition sometimes. And there's always something happening, especially if you have small kids, you travel on, this, you know, on the airplane, you get over here. <laughs> you feel like you just survived making it here. You and your kids, you're trying to stay free from all kinds of infections running through some of the airports overseas. You finally get here, and when you get here, you're, you're, you're running through all kinds of different stuff. The city changes, church changes, people change. And it's, it's you know, I'm going to be honest with you. One of the most comforting things that you can have is consistency. I know, I know for a lot of people, monotony is a bad thing. But when you live overseas, it's not a bad thing. It's like a really good thing. To have some semblance of stability and normalcy and people you see over and over. This is why, truthfully, there are people here, you would come in and talk to us when we come back on furlough. And it was incredibly encouraging. It's one of those things where out of a lot of things that are going on, you, you just don't think that's the biggest deal. But as I look back, I'm being honest with you, those are probably some of the things you remember the most because it's stability. You don't realize it at the time. At the time, you're just trying to survive and you're trying to make it through and dealing with all the different issues of culture shock, culture adjustment. You don't always recognize this is actually what's happening. But then there's those moments. Then there's those things you think about. There's those things you can't get out of your head. Like when you travel and you walk into the wrong restroom because you can't remember, you can't read the sign in their language. There's those things you can't get out of your head when you order something and you thought, man, I didn't know what that was. There's those things you can't get out of your head, like driving on the other side of the road, dodging elephants, and oxen, and homeless people. And I'm not talking about Marbach. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And I can be honest with you in telling you that some of the, like, these memories that stand out are when we would come back and Bridget would look for us. You can ask Kathleen. And she would come up to, and she'd just start talking to us. And she would encourage us. And she'd tell us, man, you know, y'all, y'all are doing so great out there. So glad to see what God, and she would be so excited. And then we come in. And, and this is what really got me thinking about it. Because then we, we come in here as assistants. And she took us out to lunch one day. And you know what she did? She imparted grace to us. She began to tell us just a lot of different things that were on her heart. How happy she was that we were here. And I want to say encourage, but the truth is you can't remember all encouragement, but I do remember that. And when I read this verse, that's what comes to my mind. She wasn't just trying to encourage us. She was imparting grace to us. Anybody can do this. We've all been given this gift. You know how I know that? Because all of us can use our words. Some of us, I mean, we really use our words. We can't stop using our words. You're the people that I really believe God can use to help a lot of people. It fascinates me that you get someone who can't stop talking about certain things. They come into church and you can't get them to talk to anyone. God has given you a gift if you can speak. And that gift is you can impart grace. You just got to find someone. You know what you don't want to get like? This is an old story, but I have to use it here because I, whenever I think about the power of words and the usage of words and how they really do have effect, not just on the people that are listening, but on the person speaking them. It's Patty Davis. This is Ronald Reagan's daughter. And in the 80s, she went to a actual event that had 100,000 people in it, and it was get a new president, and that's what the rally was for. She was there. She railed against her father. She showed up in events. They would use her as a speaker because this was the president's daughter. She'd rail at them. They rail at the president, rail at his policies. And then she grew up. Isn't that interesting? That you can get someone who's born into something, be involved in it heavily, then walk away very angrily, and then later they grow up and realize, I made a huge mistake. And the reason I use her as an example is because her story as she gets older, and her father gets Alzheimer's. If she was so filled with regret from what she did, she would go and sit with her father who had Alzheimer's and for hours try to apologize to him. He never understood, at least as far as she knew. The Alzheimer's had taken such a toll. He never had a co coherent conversation with her. But because of the power of her words and what she had done before, she was filled with such regret as she's trying to take them back, she can't. And she says, as father's passing away, she was never able to take those words back. And I believe this is why the Bible tells us this isn't just like good in sight. This isn't just something that you should do. The Bible and God knows that there will be a moment in our lives that our words, I don't believe, will just be judged and measured by God. I believe you'll do it at one time. You remember what you told your spouse when no one else reminds you. You will remember what you said to that person when no, no one else is telling you. And the truth is, your words have power. And all this scripture is trying to help us understand is use that power like God uses it to impart grace to people. That you'll never regret.
you'll never get to the end of your life and wonder, why did I say that? No, I actually think like this weekend, you'll see, you'll have people testify. They said this to me at the time I needed to hear it the most. That's a gift. Every one of us has been handed. Let's bow our heads as we close this time in prayer. As our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed in reverence to God. Appreciate your faithfulness. Appreciate your attention. Words are powerful. So powerful. The Bible says they can become vehicles to impart grace to people. They can be these channels that flow out of your life. But that means you got to have grace in your heart. That means you can't be an embittered person, angry all the time. Maybe this is one of those solutions to a complicated problem you're thinking about. Maybe you wonder, why did me and my spouse always fight? It's more about your heart than anything else. It's more about the bitterness, the anger, the resentment than it is about how articulate one is over the other. As our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed in reverence to God. No one's looking around. I shared the story of Jesus looking at the adulterous woman and saying, I don't condemn you because that's not what he came to this world to do. Jesus did not come to this world to condemn it, but the Bible says he didn't just come to condone it either. He came to save it. He came to call this world to repentance so that they could be set free. So that they did not have to live a life bound by the power of sin, bound by the addictions of this world, bound by the emotional chaos that people live in. He came so that you had an opportunity like she did when he looked her in the eyes and said, go and sin no more. You can be set free from this day forth. You don't ever have to do this again. I can tell you as a young man, I heard those words, go and sin no more. When I got saved, to realize I didn't have to be a drug addict anymore, to realize I didn't have to go down this road anymore, to realize I didn't have to live a life that was broken by the power of sin anymore. And that's what I'm telling you tonight. I'm talking to you if you're not a Christian. I'm talking to you if you're backslidden. As you sit here this evening and maybe your heart's not right with God, you're not saved, you're backslidden. I'm not telling you this is a good thing you should do because it's church. I'm not telling you maybe this is a great idea for you because you could have a better life. I'm telling you, go and sin no more. You can be free tonight. You don't have to live in hidden bondage. bondage. You don't have to live in the chains of iniquity. You can live free this evening because Jesus Christ sets us free and all those who come to him. As their heads are bowed, or eyes are closed, you say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not right with God. I'm not saved or I'm backslidden. Lift up your hand. We want to pray with you all across this place. Jesus is dealing with your heart. Lift up your hand right now, right where you're at. He wants to set you free. He doesn't want to make you religious. He doesn't want to make you a person who just goes to church. God sees that hand. Anyone else want to join this on his heart? You say, Pastor, that's me. Lift up your hand right now, right where you're at. As Jesus is reaching out to you, lift up your hand. God sees that hand. Anyone else want to join this on his heart? Say, Pastor, that's me. Lift up your hand right now, right where you're at. You lifted your hand. You lifted your hand. I want you to make your way up here right now. I want you to make your way up here right now. You lifted your hand. I want you to make your way up here right now. If you lifted your hand, just make your way up to the front right now. We're not doing this to embarrass you. We're not going to ask you to say anything to anyone. We're going to ask you to pray at this altar with someone who wants to help you meet Jesus. Not just become a part of a group, but meet Jesus who will then make you a part of a family here. As these are coming to the altar, if altar workers can help us, our, our heads are still bowed, our eyes are still closed. The power of words in a lot of people's lives seems to be understated, especially in our country, where words are cheap, where a lot of times we, we say things not even thinking about it, and we say things, and, and I, you know, the truth is, most of you know, especially if you've ever been with me, hung out with me, I like to joke around a lot. 
I enjoy humor. But one thing I do know is that when the Bible speaks of these words and it's talking about the emphasis, importance of words, it's not that you have to live on eggshells around people. That's political correctness. What the Bible's helping us understand is trying to give us a revelation. Your words have real power to hurt people, to corrupt them, or to impart grace, just like God does. That you can say something to someone at a moment, that you can be with someone here in church not knowing exactly what's going on, and you just begin to tell them and encourage them. And God inspires you just to tell. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be all articulate. It just has to come from the heart. I can tell you honestly, the times when I was in ministry, some of the times that encouraged me the most was when I was fellowshipping with people. And they just started t encouraging and telling me, and we were talking, and that person had no idea that they were imparting grace into my life. Use your words wisely, especially for the new people that come into church. God wants to use you to impart grace. Let's stand to our feet. These altars are open. As we stand to our feet, we sing a song of worship and of praise tonight. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I was, was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has rested on me, and like a flood, His mercy Amazing grace, t'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace. ransom me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace my chains are gone I've been set free my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy raised unending love, amazing. Let's give God praise and worship His name this evening. Um, I had just talked to someone recently who um, was telling me this story that they had been told something when they first got saved. And it wasn't good. It was actually a very discouraging thing. And what's interesting to me is years later, in the right moment at the right time, it like leaped back to the forefront. Like rotten fish that's hidden, but it comes out at that right time and stinks everything up. 
The reason I say that is because if uh, that, that whole part that I was talking about with corrupted words and everything, if, if that's ever happened to you, somebody spoke something, you can remember it even now, you need to judge that. You need to realize that was wrong. It's not true. It's wrong. You reject it. That's an important part of a Christian maturing is discerning and looking and seeing, okay, that wasn't true. That was a lie. That was a lie, and you judge that tonight. You judge that. That's an important uh, thing. That's an important principle and an important exercise to have in your life. When people say things. Not everybody says things that will help and encourage you. I know that firsthand. When I first got all kinds of crazy people talk to you. You be, I'm a Christian now, and then out of the woodwork, all these other Christians who are nuts come and talk to you. And it's then that you realize, okay, this person's nuts. I can't listen to them. What they're saying is crazy. You have to judge that. You have to judge that. And if it's something, I would encourage you. Somebody's told you something, it's really, it stays in your spirit. Talk to one of the pastors here. Talk to one of us. Because sometimes you need to pray for that and say, all right, I'm, I'm not going to accept that anymore. I'm not going to accept that anymore. Let's bow our heads as we close this time in prayer this evening. I appreciate everybody and their attention. You remember the outreach tomorrow as well at UTSA and the service on Wednesday night as my brother Rick Glenn, I'll close us off in prayer this evening.